different stories <laughs> from two very different uh, journalists working in very different ways. Uh, but uh, before I introduce them, I'm just going to give a very important message that on the ladies' room there was found a smartphone. Who are we? If somebody is uh, lacking their smartphone, exactly, Jan Gunnar has the smartphone. Okay, so today uh, we're going to meet uh, Sean O'Driscoll. He's a journalist from uh, Ireland. He's been working in the UAE, the Emirates, been based uh, partly in Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai, been working on the uh, workers, the slave workers in the Gulf. And then it's uh, Tuburi Ovori, she has been working on uh, trafficking. So because your stories are different, we'll first hear, hear from uh, Sean. So we spend the first half hour or, or so with Sean and then with Tuburi. I think it's, uh, it's going to work best that way, that we mm -hmm. concentrate on the two very different ways of working. Uh, so Sean Driscoll, uh, has been working for four years in the Arab Emirates and uh, he's been doing news stories about the uh, foreign workers there. Uh, you are also a human rights lawyer, yes. yeah. a trained lawyer, and uh, been publishing your work in the New York Times and The Guardian and you're now working with a documentary for BBC. It's going to be shown on BBC World and BBC Arabic. And um, you want to open your session with uh, a small presentation, and then we'll talk a bit after your presentation. Okay. Um, will I stand up or sit down? Um, uh, as you please. Okay. Well, I suppose I just wanted to maybe give some, some pointers here on, on how, to do, how to investigate this issue, because uh, I know you're all very accomplished, but maybe there's just some talking points here on ways into this subject, because it can be very complex. If, if you let it be, but if you find a simplicity in it, then it can actually be quite easy to, to investigate slavery and human trafficking and so on. So I just want to do um, a few pointers here. This is just, uh, I've made as many mistakes as, as successes in, in this area, so I want to cut out time for a lot of you just by you know, learning from my mistakes as much as successes. Um, this is really important for, I know a lot of people are, are interested in, in uh, the Qatar World Cup, and um, obviously in the UE we have Guggenheim Museum, the Louvre Museum, all these international projects. And uh, for the international media, they're really only interested in this. You know, if you, if you call up and you're kind of, you, you want to connect your, your subject to, uh, to a, a bridge building project in the UEE or strawberry picker, pickers in Mexico, uh, the, the media value goes up a thousand times if you can find the international connection to these projects. In my case, that's why I focused on uh, the Louvre, the Guggenheim, New York University, these kind of projects, because immediately you have uh, international attention. Um, these were you know, the projects that I was really uh, investigating uh, the most, including uh, Burj Khalifa, which is the world's tallest building, where there was a huge problem with the Chinese workers. Um, single biggest problem is finding the workers, because you, you can't go on to construction sites and, and find them. Or in the case of you know, strawberry pickers in America or so on, you're immediately going to attract attention. So, uh, the only way to do that for me was to just just follow the buses. Um, when I was investigating New York University for the New York Times, I would just for three months I would just sit there in a car um, at the car park and just just follow buses going out of there back when they were finished their shift, and uh, started to build up this kind of database of all the different companies that were on there and, and the various problems with the workers. And it just amazed me the the number of journalists who would come to the UEE who were very accomplished, but they, they felt that they could go to the companies or they could go to the government and, and find out about these issues. You'll find out absolutely nothing from the government except they're just going to put a surveillance car on you and follow you, you know. So you have to start with the workers and stay with the workers. And the only way to do that is just, you know, the old-fashioned way, just, just follow those buses out of there and write down the registration number of the bus because, you know, you have many dis different buses going at once. Um, just to give an illustration of the complexity, you have... In just one company I started to investigate here, you find um, Emirati companies who are working for a Filipino company, which is working for a UK company, which is working for an Emirati UK company, which is working for a US company. So, uh, you know, I, I would find foreign journalists who come in and, and they're trying to uh, find some way through this. But, like, again, you, you know, you have to go straight to the, to, to the labor camps, find out where those workers are, and um, it's the only way through this complexity. Um, this is a big one that I wish I had, I'd learned from the beginning. Is, you know, some of these 
institutions like New York University, they, they had a, kind of a human rights compliance system that looked on paper, looked fantastic. And I didn't investigate them in the beginning because I thought that they had a, a really good system in place. And you're going to find that for the, the World Cup in Qatar too. You know, you have all these kind of very great uh, human rights compliance systems. But when you look underneath the surface, it's just not the case because you can't undo, you know, 50 years of, of complete exploitation of workers just on paper, you know. So that was a big fault on my part that I didn't, I, I trusted the paper in the beginning and then the more I dug, the more I realized that the paper is, is meaningless. Um, in fact, this is, uh, this is called uh, Labour Camp uh, Number 42 in Dubai. Um, this was, um, uh, the workers were building New York University, their largest subcontractor. And I followed the bus uh, back to Dubai and the workers told me about the, they went on strike and the police came in and they beat all the workers and tasered them and uh, took a lot of them to jail and deported 300 of them. And meanwhile, NYU is reporting, you know, these human rights reports saying that everything is fine and all the workers are happy. So, you know, this was a, a big lesson for me, like just never ever trust the official version. Um, yeah. Uh, this is what got me in trouble with The Guardian, you know, they, they blurred out my face, but it was obvious there's some tall Irish guy asking questions and they didn't protect me enough. And I, uh, recently I had a problem with, uh, or a discussion with HBO Vice with the same thing. I wasn't going to let the same thing happen to the workers. You know, you, you've got to remember that they're, they're sitting there with a cappuccino in New York or London. It, it, it doesn't hit home to them how careful they have to be. And you have to check and recheck with them because um, you know, they don't have the same interest in protecting the workers that you do. Uh, this was me in the Guardian video. Now, I'm blacked out and my voice is distorted, but um, it's pretty obvious to the authorities that was me because they, as soon as this was broadcast, and I had a surveillance car on me, and that was the beginning of all my troubles. Um, uh, just, I think on this issue, you know, wherever you find slavery or modern exploitation, you're going to find. Um, you're going to find oppressive governments trying to find out who's doing this. So you just you have to let go of your own ego and just like keep mixing up your bylines. And these are just some of the bylines I used um, for different newspapers to try and confuse the government. Uh, this is a surveillance car that was following me all the time. And it got so ridiculous, I would just get out in the morning and then I, I would see him and I would just tell him to follow me. And <laughs> we would just go off for the day. <laughs> and, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of intimate in a way. Um, this is us at a... This is... Um, this is us at a, at a petrol station, and at that point, I was trying to uh, trying to get some mechanics to to get the the uh, tracking device off my car. So the police were following me as I was trying to get their tracking device off my car. Um, but what I discovered actually was that they don't put a tracking device on your car. And this is for God. I know I don't reply this to the UE. I apply it everywhere. The days of putting a tracking device on your car are gone. You know, it's all on the phone now, and they've got amazing software that. All they have to do is just put in your phone number and they'll just follow your phone everywhere you go. I wish I had known that. That was a big mistake on my part that I didn't know that. And um, it took me a while of trial, trial and error to figure out that they were following my phone and not my car. Um, yeah, even still, just you know, change, change your car frequently. Uh, I had a rental car and I always made sure it was white because all the cars are white in the Gulf. So it just confused the police a little bit more. Um, yeah, by... Uh, Again, this is, a, this, is, this is one of my biggest mistakes, I think, not to get an unregistered SIM card, which you can buy on the black market in many, many countries uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, and so on. And just, it really helps to just um, keep the police off your back while you're investigating these issues. Um, this area was a, a market in Abu Dhabi I call the, the Inferno, like Dante's Inferno, because it was like layers of vice. In the beginning, it was uh, vegetables, and then you go further into the market, and it's like slaughtering chickens and meat. And then it was uh, gambling, roulette tables, and so on. And then it was pornography in every South Asian language. And then behind that was um, SIM cards, which is obviously like the most vice you can have. Um, <laughs> but they were unregistered, so the, the government couldn't trace them. And the workers offered me one, and I didn't take it. And I really, you know, regret not doing that. Um, this is me just, you know, trying to stay nice to the authorities, even while they were chasing me around. Just <laughs> keep them happy. Um, this, this one, you know, I wish somebody had taught me about was just um, to stay in with human, human rights groups because I, I, their media contacts are absolutely fantastic and um, to, to, to expand the story into the New York Times and the Guardian and so on, this, that all came through human rights groups. 
Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and if you want to cover this issue, you know, try and keep in with these groups and, um, you know, whether you're like in Africa or America or, or the Gulf, they, they have connections absolutely everywhere. Um, but um, just be very, very careful of activist groups that, I mean, that's going to get you a lot of trouble with the government and that was a mistake I made too, that I, I uh, showed these groups around and um, it just immediately got me into much, much deeper trouble and got very little thanks for it. Um, uh, this is a really important one. Um, j journalists tend to come in and then they try to find a professional translator, but professional translators know absolutely nothing about this subject. In every labour camp you'll find somebody with perfect English who's a migrant who's escaping, who in my case he was a United Nations worker, um, very, very smart guy, knew the whole system inside out. Um, this is him in, in Vice magazine, they covered up his face, um, but he's left the country now, this is him in reality, Kabir. This was us uh, investigating Camp 42. Um, uh, just common sense stuff, just, you know, don't pay for a year's rent in advance. <laughs> uh, thank God I didn't, I was arrested at the airport and deported just before I could put down a, a year's rent, which is what is expected in Dubai. Uh, a Dutch, Dutch journalist told me this one, use Hushmail instead of uh, Gmail. You know, repressive governments have ways into Gmail and Yahoo now so easily that uh, Hushmail is absolutely excellent. It's free, it's really useful. Uh, quick voice, absolutely brilliant service on the phone. Uh, when I was arrested, you just, you know, press a button on your phone, police don't suspect it, and I managed to tape, um, you know, the entire interrogation with the police where they tried to turn me into uh, a spy to spy on other foreign journalists who are coming into the country which led to this uh, Newsweek article. This wouldn't have been published in Newsweek, only that you know, they had the verification from my phone from Quick Voice that uh, the police had tried to convert me to a spy. Otherwise, I would have sounded like you know, some conspiracy nut. But it was all there on the phone, so um, these kind of technologies are great. Um, maybe I'll end on this one. This is really, really important for uh, getting into this issue, or, or many, many issues. I think it's, it's underused by investigative journalists. Google Scholar is incredible because uh, academics have, have much, much uh, better insight or uh, access to documents that we never have as journalists um, and to, to track slavery and, and human trafficking. Um, there was many, many academics who were able to get in and um, find ways into the story that I wasn't able to. I'll just give you an example. Um, this was a, um, a doctor who, who uh, was looking at injuries to um, camel jockeys. These are uh, little children that were trafficked, in many cases kidnapped from Bangladesh and Pakistan and who were um, put on the back of camels for camel racing, which is very popular in the Gulf. Um, you can see there the ages of the children here, uh, five years of age and the, the injuries that they sustained from, from camel racing. Um, a lot of times they were bought from families or simply kidnapped by, by brokers and brought to the Gulf. The practice is banned now, but we were never able to get into it as journalists. Absolutely no way would the government cooperate on anything like that. But, uh, you know, Google Scholar and these kind of academic searches, you can find amazing information. You can see, like, children five years of age, five, six, eight years of age, and just the terrible injuries that they sustained that, uh, to me, it illustrated. I mean, this was the worst slavery I've ever come across in my life. I mean, this was, you know, I mean, this is kidnapping for slavery. It was horrendous. And um, thank God it, it's finished now, but I, I thought that this was a t terrific device to use, you know. Again, it's just finding the, the simplicity and the complexity of these issues, you know, just find that, that one person and um, it just makes it so much easier. Um, and just, you know, expect to be asked for money or help and just be prepared for that and explain why you can't do that and how that compromises the story. And um, in my case, you know, you make it, it this happens a lot in the Gulf, Police will try and try and bribe you and coerce you and bring you into their system. And um, you just got to be prepared for that. That it mightn't be deportation. They might offer you money, and you've got to you know you got to remember that. That's it. Okay. <laughs> it's a flare of uh, working like uh, James Bond on the cover, <laughs> changing SIM cards, changing cars, and. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, what actually happened also is that uh, the police actually asked you to be a spy to spy on other journalists. Yes, Can you say yeah. a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Pull this up. Oh. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, um, that you know that is um, that's one that I, I really want to warn everybody in, in the room about that there are you've got to be very very careful when you when you're investigating these issues that there is a tendency among journalists to call other journalists in the country but you mightn't be aware of what their involvement is um, you know I I got an illustration of that myself after we did a front page story on in the New York Times an investigation into the workers in NYU and then the police brought me in and. Um, they put a lot of money on the table and they offered me immunity from prosecution, not just for, for the story, but for um, drink driving offences or, you know, if I punched somebody in a pub, they would make that go away and they would even get me more uh, vacation time or holiday time from my employers. They would just call them up if I wanted that. But in an exchange, I was to uh, write monthly reports on any journalists who were coming in investigating the UEE and I would um, immediately you know, report back to the police what they were doing in the country, what they were investigating, and so on. Um, it was a bloody good deal, by the way. I, um, <laughs> Did you ever consider This is a cautionary <laughs> example. This isn't an opportunity. I just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't consider. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no. Um, they, I mean, it was a quite sophisticated operation. They clearly had done this before because they. They said, you know, we, have, we want you to keep up your front on the international scene by, by writing, but they said that you can occasionally we let you write negative stories about the UEE as well. Um, and we'll, the expression was, we'll take the hit on that. Um, so they were very smart in that they, they wanted me to write uh, positive stories about the UEE, but they knew that my credibility, uh, my front would, would be blown on, uh, unless I wrote negative stories as well. So they would kind of engineer these negative stories for me. Uh, you know, that would be damaging, but not too damaging, so... You also said that you have to put your ego aside and use different uh, bylines, like we saw an example of. Yeah, um... So you're not going to get many prices if you, no. <laughs> you never <laughs> use your own byline, but this is the way to report. Yeah, it was the only way to really, you know, for, for The Guardian I used uh, Glenn Carrick, which is the name of my parents' house. And then for the independent, I used Tom South, kind of a, a reference to an Irish rebel from songs called um, Sean South. And I always kind of maybe left a little trace of myself in the names. <laughs> but unfortunately for the New York Times, they wouldn't let me use uh, a fake name. And uh, I mean, this went on for more than a month. I would say, you know, can I say John instead of Sean? It's on my passport. No, you can't. And they said that this would be a deception to their readers. But they were prepared to put their own reporter's name on the story, which I felt was more of a deception because, you know, I was doing all the work. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, I mean, it was a terrible decision to have to make, and I only made it on, on, on the last minute, and then I realized I'd made a big mistake, and I tried to call the New York Times, and then I fell asleep in my hotel room and woke up the next morning, and then the police <laughs> were calling, so it was too late. Yeah. But, but um, these workers have horrible conditions, and it's very important that we talk about this because yeah. the uh, Qatar uh, Football Cup is coming up uh, 2022, so a lot more journalists yeah. should do investigative uh, journalism yeah. on the topic. But did you feel that uh, the workers themselves wanted to talk with you? Or were they scared that they would lose their work opportunities? It, it really depended on, I feel uh, in the smaller labor camps, you find this in Qatar, if any of you are interested in going, it's the same as the UEE in that you have massive big labor camps and then you ha also have very small uh, tenement buildings uh, in the city center. Those are far, far easier. I mean, you have total access in, into the, the, maybe the, the overcrowded uh, apartment buildings where, where the workers live. Uh, the ones who live on the bigger labour camps, their security there, um, it's a little tougher. The toughest of all, by a long way, was the workers for BK Gulf, which is the largest construction company in Britain. Those, those are the ones that, uh, that were beaten by the police um, when they striked at, at NYU. That, they were absolutely terrified. Uh, it, took, it took a long time to really kind of um, get into the story. And the way into that really was to stand there at the construction buses and say, guys, I'm not going to talk to anybody here, but I want to know the names of the guys who were deported to Bangladesh and Pakistan. And once I said that, then everything changed, because then they understood that I wasn't out to get them, but they knew that those guys were free to talk, you know. And then, like, I just stood there one day, I got 60 numbers, just stood there and just number, number, number. And then myself and Kabir, the translator, we just, we went back to Abu Dhabi from 6 a.m. the next morning until 10 o'clock at night. We were just calling Bangladesh non-stop until we found as many of those workers as we could, you know. 
Um, I did one story about uh, the workers in uh, Dubai, and I remember we went very quickly in and very quickly out, and uh, very difficult to work there. But, uh, you know, I am smaller and darker, but I am a woman, so I was alone with, I think, uh, 2,000 men in the camp. But you are tall and uh, whiter and Irish and really stand out. Uh, yeah. So once you come into a labor camp, everybody must know that you, I mean, obviously yeah. not of them, yeah. not of one of them. Oh, it's, it, that's a huge problem too, yeah. Um, especially in, in South Asian culture, you know, there's just such a culture of, of finding out, like everybody just stares and comes to see what's going on. And this was a huge problem at uh, Abu Dhabi airport when I was trying to interview the workers who were being deported from the Louvre project, the, the French uh, art museum they were building in Abu Dhabi. But I, I, I managed to get one of the deported workers to come over and talk to me on camera for The Guardian. But of course, all the South Asian workers come over to see what's going on. And, you know, you have to be very careful of that. The only way to do it, I think, is to uh, try to talk to one worker, get his number, and then see if you can meet him later. You know, there's always, around the labor camps, you'll always find little coffee shops and stuff like that. And, and that's definitely the best way to do it. Uh, last question before we move over to the next topic. Uh, you know, what is appalling is that the Louvre, uh, New York University, and, uh, of course, the FIFA World Cup are a part of this exploitation. But when you posted your stories, did you get any reactions, any feeling of guilt and shame from these uh, international companies? I mean, did the journalism work? The journalism worked. In, in, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a sense of guilt, but um, in terms of uh, accomplishment, the, the, definitely the New York University one is the highlight of my career in, in terms of uh, getting a result, because there was a... For the first time ever in the Gulf, uh, government agreed to pay for an independent investigation, which led to the, the independent investigators from America backed up the claims in the article. So now there's a compensation system put in place, which will be at least $1 million, but it'll probably be several million dollars for the workers at NYU, which will really transform lives in Bangladesh and Pakistan. I, I called some of the workers in, in Bangladesh to tell them what had happened, and you know, one of them was crying on the phone, and. Uh, it's, I can't even describe the feeling, like, you know, after all the frustration and chasing the buses and all the madness, uh, to, to feel that uh, it will change his life and his family's life, absolutely the highlight of my journalism career and, you know, just, I'm just so, so grateful that it all happened, you know. But the awful thing is also that a lot of the workers, they come back and they come back and they come back because where they are coming from, it's even worse. Yeah, yeah. That this is an argument that's often used in, in, in the UEE, the government, oh, well, you know, they come from Bangladesh and Pakistan, and, uh, and you know, which I respond, uh, Abu Dhabi is the richest city in the world. I mean, do you really, is that the conditions you're comparing yourself to Bangladesh, like, you know, which is, on, three million people died in a civil war, you know, like, is that, is that, is that the comparison you want to make, you know? And um, then they start to see a different way, I think. You we'll know. move from the uh, workers in the Gulf to uh, Nigeria and to, to, to Bori, to Bora, to yeah. Bori. Uh, you try to uh, find out what goes on when um, uh, young Nigerians are being exploited by human traffickers. Okay. And uh, I really would uh, recommend everybody to read uh, to Bori's uh, story. Uh, from the uh, Premium Times in Nigeria, investigation inside Nigeria's ruthless human trafficking mafia. You tried to find out from the inside what was going on, and you, uh, you went out on a very uh, dangerous uh, journey. And the reason why you did it is because you had a friend that was yes. a victim of trafficking. She came back with AIDS and she died. Yes. So what did you want to find out? Um, when we embarked on the investigation, um, while we're doing the risk analysis, the intention was not for me to get trafficked to Italy itself. Uh, the intention was to get embedded, find out the processes. We just wanted to know, have a feel, what is really going on. Uh, the young ladies and the young men, were they being forced or they were going willingly on their own? We wanted to have the inside details. 
that was the major reason for doing the story. So um, you knew that they were being uh, uh, trafficked to be uh, prostitutes, and uh, you know you knew that was uh, part of the journey that the others were uh, going out on. In the course of the investigation, uh, we discovered that, okay, for instance, the group I traveled with, uh, the young ladies and the young men, they were the ones who went seeking the, tra the trolleys. I wouldn't call them the traffickers, the trolleys. Trolleys are agents to the traffickers, those who do the recruiting. They went seeking the trolleys themselves, meaning they went willingly uh, unfortunately, I don't think they really had the idea what they would expect over there, though they knew they would be prostituting when they get to Italy. So they knew that they would be uh, maybe luxury prostitutes or some of the girls? In my own case, it was during the course of the investigation, things were unfolding, I had to go through various tests, that's the various syndicates I met before I finally decided, okay, I would travel with this group. Uh, for the various young men and women, until they got into the act itself, they didn't know they would have to strip to, for their bodies to be assessed uh, so that the trolleys would decide which group they would belong to. Either they would belong to the luxury group or they would be placed on the streets. It depends on how beautiful you are as a lady. I didn't know this from the beginning of the investigation. It was when I was in the process when uh, I was told, okay, you have to strip, we need to assess you. And I was placed in the group of uh, the very beautiful ones, you, the luxury group. You were 10 people in that group. And you were going to, you, you were labeled as product, and it was like the, uh, you know, the better product and the more lousy product. So it was the products who could be, uh, uh, you know, fashionable prostitutes, and there was the street yes, people. Yes, the ten of us were the luxury, were in the luxury group. And in the course, or you know, the meetings, you learned how to pickpocket. Yes, to that was another shocking aspect. To, if you had been with a man, you, you knew how to, or you were learning how to take his uh, money and his watch and, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what did you want to disclose? You wanted to find the names behind the, traffi uh, tra uh, the, the, the trafficking uh, syndicates. When we set out to do the investigation, we wanted to know the process. We wanted to know the reasons others don't know yet. Does these young ladies, are they being forced or uh, they were going willingly on their own? And of course, get to know who are the traffickers or who are the trolleys. Just get to know everything about the process. And uh, we are going to try to see a part of a film about uh, your inv investigation. Morten, you ready? Sopare Wolveri is a cup reporter for the online investigative newspaper Premium Times in Nigeria. I didn't stumble into journalism, I chose journalism. At the age of five, I made up my mind I was going to become a journalist. I grew up with so much injustice around me political, economical, social injustice. I wanted to make a difference with the power of the written words. So when she heard that a school friend had been trafficked to Europe, she felt compelled to act. Trafficking, especially sex, sex trafficking, is rampant in Nigeria. According to Nigerian authorities, six out of ten people trafficked to the West are Nigerians. Men and women are smuggled via Morocco across the Mediterranean to become sex workers in Europe. She took her story to her managing editor, Mojid Musikulu, who agreed. How to do it was the challenge. People have talked about how people are trafficked, 
but we just wanted to know the process. And to do that, Tobore would go undercover and approach a trafficking syndicate. The team partnered with another investigative publication, Zam Chronicle, based in Amsterdam. Manager Evelyn Hrunink was impressed by the gutsy young journalist. Many countries, especially in Nigeria, undercover is one of the few methods that you can use to actually get a true story out there. Because if you if you just ask for official papers or ask people for formal uh, explanations of things, you hardly get anywhere. The team spent weeks planning for every eventuality. In all likelihood, Tobare would be smuggled across the border to neighboring Benin, often the first stop on the trafficking route. Nobody was actually planning on getting her traffic to Italy or Egypt or wherever. After crossing the border, she finds a way to escape. That was what we thought. But first, Tobare needed to make contact with the traffickers. She spent four months pretending to be a prostitute. I knew I needed to win their trust first. I couldn't just walk up to them. Hey, I want to be trafficked. No. How far did you go? I was always calling out outrageous prices to clients who came my way. I was doing that deliberately just to get them disinterested in me. Tobore took us to the streets where she'd worked undercover. So how would they have reacted if they had known you were a journalist I would undercover? have been killed. I would have been killed. So, every day, that's the risk you were taking? Yeah. Finally, one night, she was invited to attend a party hosted by a member of the trafficking mafia. Here, she made it known she was ready to move to the next level. In the underworld, they call it the next level. That's how I like to move to the next level. I don't want to prostitute locally anymore. And they asked me, what route do you want to go? Do you want to go to Spain? Do you want to go to Italy? Tobore was made to strip and was paraded in front of a drunken crowd. She passed the test and was told she was to be trafficked to Italy. But first to Lagos, the main departure point for those trafficked to Europe. Tobore and nine others, including three boys, were loaded into a taxi bound for Benin. A surprising twist in this tale for me is that, in a sense, human trafficking is an open market. Many of those who participate are actually volunteers, mm -hmm. and so the traffickers are You can are stop it, and we'll continue choice. the conversation. Okay. So, uh, you, were find, you were found uh, sort of unfit. You were taken to a voodoo doctor. And what did the voodoo doctor say about you? Because the traffickers wanted to check you with the voodoo doctor. Um, when we started our journey in Lagos, we were taken to the middle of nowhere, somewhere in nowhere, I'll call it somewhere in nowhere. And um, there was a voodoo doctor. Um, it turned out that unlike before, before commencing the journey, I had done my research about the processes of human trafficking, but this other aspect, it turned out that uh, they now check, they call it checking the stars, the destiny of their products. The products are the girls and the young men they are taking out. Because they had discovered over the years that there are some people, no matter what is done, they just don't meet their targets. They don't get good customers. So the fetish aspect they believed that some persons are not destined for such. So the voodoo doctor was going to check, check all that. your energy, your destiny, or yes. you know, if, if you were under a curse or something. Yeah. And, and what did he find out? Find out. He tagged me a bad product. Bad product. I was going to bring trouble to your customers. <laughs> yeah. Was in your hair? After doing some incantations, he told the trolley that I shouldn't be taken to Italy because I was a bad product, I was going to cause them so much trouble that I should be taken back to wherever they brought me from. And um, 
three other persons were equally spotted. Um, as we gassed my hair, uh, the trolley didn't listen to the voodoo doctor because she had somewhat gotten herself attached to me. Uh, because I recall when I failed during the pickpocket session, uh, she had yelled at me the next day, warning me I shouldn't try, I shouldn't test her patience, that the only reason she was being patient with me uh, was because I looked so much like one of her daughters. Uh, it turned out that she had a daughter who was in college in the UK that I looked like her daughter. Uh, I guess it's one of the reasons she had this special likeness for me. She was fond of me. Uh, so rather than letting me go, she, I, I recall she was telling the voodoo doctor she had invested so much on me so she wouldn't let me go. She took me to three other voodoo doctors. It was the last one she took me to who shaved my hair. And, shaved um, your hair? Yes. Um, the voodoo doctor had claimed my power was in my hair. That was a complete lie. I had no power in my hair. Uh, what comes of out next? I will read because it's uh, difficult for you to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, you were some unfit products then. Very unfit. Very unfit products. What happens next is like a horror movie. We Unlucky four are standing aside. Mama C talks with five well-dressed, classy, influential-looking visitors. The issue is a package that Mama C has promised them and she hasn't been able to deliver. The woman points at me, but Mama C refuses and for explained reasons, Adeswa and Umay, that's two of the others, are selected. We all witness screaming and trying to hide in the corners as they are grabbed and beheaded. Beheaded with machetes in front of us. The package that the visitors have come, uh, have uh, come for turns out to be a, collecting, collect, a collection of body parts. The mafia that holds us is into organ traffic too. With all of us trembling and crying, I and the other three unsuitable ones are herded into separate rooms. Mama C comes later to take me to yet another room for questioning. Angry beyond measure, she whips me at night, telling me to yield information on the forces protecting me. You are going nowhere, she keeps shouting. I have invested too much in you. You managed to escape on the border between Nigeria and... Uh, the and Republic of Benin. Yeah, uh, the Republic of uh, Benin. Uh, you managed to escape and to uh, get into touch with another journalist and you are saved. Yeah. But when you came back, obviously with, uh, with some horrible experiences, how did your uh, bosses in the newspapers take care of you? I would say... It was the toughest moment for us in premium times um, because subsequently I broke down and um, I was in the psychiatric ward in the hospital in Abuja. The human resource department shifted their office to the hospital. They were with me throughout. Uh, my managing editor, Musikilu Mojid, was always in the hospital. Um, though he was trying to really encourage me, uh, but I could see so much sorrow in his eyes and fear. It wasn't an easy one for him having one of his reporters break in down. Um, I was in the hospital for some weeks and um, when I was discharged I later broke down again. Um, 
the management, my colleagues, they really helped me. I'm still, in, I'm still recovering, uh, but they really helped me to get back on my feet uh, because a part of my reaction to trauma was I was eating so much and I gained so much weight. I used to be very skinny. All of a sudden, I'd grown so big. It affected my self-esteem. I avoided seeing myself in the mirror. I had weeping spells. And um, they helped me. They would crack me up, make me laugh. Um, at the time, I was weighing 110 kilograms, and they would tell me, you are beautiful. Uh, I don't think they knew, but the words really helped me, the encouraging words. Um, at the time, they discovered that I'd lost part of my memory. And um, I recall my editor, Majid, he had to reintroduce me. He showed me my office, where it used to be my office. This is your office. This is your desk. He had to reintroduce some of my colleagues to me because I had lost timeline of a part of my life. And uh, my immediate boss discovered I was losing touch with writing already. So they're quite busy in the newsroom. But he had to... They became so patient with me. I'm so grateful for having such support. And uh, had to teach me all over. Uh, I've been on sick leave for the past two years, and my salary is still being paid. And um, every Tuesdays, they would come take me, somebody from the human resource department would come take me to the hospital would be there all through, would take me back home. Uh, after I broke down, the human resource department, somebody was assigned to me, had to teach me about living all over again, would come in the morning to help me have my bath. Um, premium times, we are a closely knitted family, and um, they really helped me the management, my colleagues, great, wonderful people. They helped me to get back on my feet. They gave me a reason to want to live again, notwithstanding the struggles I was having. For each time, I had the temptation of wanting to give up. Uh, Mojit's face would flash through my mind. My managing director's face mm. would go through my mind and mm. Uh, I would tell myself, if nothing else, these people, I should live for them. They've been wonderful to me. You did publish uh, your story. And um, it's a very, very important story because, uh, like we heard in the film, it's uh, impossible to expose these people w without actually going into those uh, situations, yes. it was much worse than you expected. But do you regret it? No, I don't. I don't regret it whatsoever. Why? I recall, okay, for a long while I was offline, I was off my email. Then when I got back online to my email, uh, I got an email from somebody, and um, the person was thanking me and um, said she had been trafficked before she got deported to Spain. And um, she was actually looking for every way to go back there. And when she read, she stumbled across the story, she read it. And um, it dawned on her that trafficking is no longer the way it used to be before. And um, it's more it the, gave her a major reason to have a change of mind. Not too long ago, she sent me another email 
that she has completed, she went to a fashion school. And uh, now she has a sewing machine of her own. And um, she started sewing, though she doesn't have an office space, she's utilizing her elder sister's apartment. Um, she just wrote me to say thank you for saving her life. Um, if, though I'm certain that is not the only life that has been affected, but if that is the only life that has been affected, I think I'm satisfied with that. So I don't regret it whatsoever. I will ask you one more question and then I will open uh, the floor. If somebody has a question for Sean or Tabora, you can ask a question in a few minutes if you want to uh, pose some questions. Uh, what have you learned from this? I mean, if you would do that again, knowing what you know today, what would you have done different? If I'm going to do this story again, uh, some of the mistakes I wouldn't make, the first is I wouldn't underrate anybody. Before the investigation, I had a good knowledge of street life. Um, I underrated the people I was traveling with. Uh, I felt, in Nigeria, they are, the street watchings, we call them area boys. I felt they can't be different from the area boys I know. I didn't know there was more to them. So if I were to do this story again, I wouldn't underrate anybody. I wouldn't be overconfident, one. Two, for such a story as this, the reporter must be very patient. Uh, I started the story in May 2013 and concluded it in November 2013. To be honest, um, I guess this will be the first time my editor will be here in Mojid. To be honest, I became impatient at a time. I felt, oh, this is dragging for too long. I just want to conclude this and move to the next project. Uh, if I were to do this again, I wouldn't be impatient. And uh, another aspect, if I were to do this story again, that I would really take note of, uh, when I was about leaving for the final phase of the investigation, uh, our spy cameras had stopped working, turned out. Spy even cameras. after Yes, they were not working. Uh, ideally, uh, I should have paused the investigation to get better and new spy cameras. Uh, but I didn't. I simply felt that, oh, I could use my phone. Uh, really, I was able to get the phone in there. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the phone out there. Uh, if it were a spy camera, I would have been able to get the spy cameras in there, and I would have come out with the spy cameras without being detected. So if I were to do this story again, and it turns out that any of my gadgets is faulty. I would pause the investigation until I get that aspect rectified. So that was a huge mistake um, I made. Uh, then another aspect I would, a mistake I wouldn't make again. I wouldn't get so emotionally involved. But how is that? <laughs> emotionally. Involved? Yes, in quotes. I wouldn't get so emotionally involved uh, because um, I recall the first time I was to leave for the final phase of the investigation, um, my editor and the managing director had said, please, hold on. And I told them, oh, the traffickers have been, the trolleys, I mean, have been harassing me with phone calls that let's get these done. I held on them. Um, then the second time, that's as regards when we discovered the spy cameras were not working. Um, I think I shouldn't have allowed my emotions to take me over. I should have allowed my brain 
to be in charge, not my emotions. It's a lot to ask for. Yeah. Uh, I want to hear if anybody has a question. To Sean or to Bora? We have a question there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Musiki Lumajid. Uh, Tobore is a uh, managing editor. Now, you, you asked a question about uh, the lessons uh, we learned. Of course, maybe Tobore didn't uh, remember to hard that we, our risk analysis was pretty poor, which was uh, one lesson we learned. Uh, we never realized that uh, uh, Tobore would be camped for this. You know, why being taken through pickpocketing lessons and all of that. What we saw and what we thought was going to happen was that Tobore would join the team you know, we were in Abuja, that Tobore would join the team in Lagos, and then they would just try to traffic them across the border, where we had positioned um, a reporter based in Benin Republic, who we thought would help in uh, rescuing Tobore from the gang. Uh, we didn't know that aspect of uh, being camped uh, didn't occur to us, and so, you know, she could have been killed because we didn't see our risk analysis was pretty poor. Maybe instead of doing that internally ourselves, we should have contacted uh, experts to help us assess the risk involved in the investigation. And that was why I was pretty really afraid when um, this whole thing turned out the way it was and Tuburi became a psychiatric case. And I was saying to myself, then what am I going to tell people, the world that we weren't able to properly assess the situation? Now, one other aspect Tobore didn't mention was that at a point she became so bad, her health deteriorated so bad, that we needed to cry out for global support. And the International Women Media Foundation came to our aid and uh, even the trauma center. And then we had to get to Bure to the United States for treatment for months. So, and then she got back and she's been recovering, but she hasn't gotten back to work yet. Thank you. We have two questions here. And I think uh, that's what we have time for, two questions. Uh, hi, my name is Jan. I work in a uh, Norwegian newspaper. A uh, bit louder. I, I, Norwegian government is uh, uh, sending a trafficking victim in Norway back to Nigeria. Uh, this girl says they fear for their lives. Uh, they fear uh, that they will be taken back and uh, sent out in the, this trafficking situation again. Would you mind commenting on their chance, uh, on their situation uh, when the Norwegian government is resending them, sending them back to Nigeria? I didn't get the question. No, he's saying that uh, in Norway there are uh, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, Nigerian uh, girls, and they said they don't want to go back to Nigeria because they don't have uh, uh, the rights to stay here or the right papers. So uh, he's asking if, if you think it's right or wrong to send those girls back to Nigeria. Should they get asylum here on a humanitarian uh, basis? Personally, um, if it has been proven beyond all doubt that truly the girls were trafficked, so we're talking about a case of trafficking, I would rather say please grant them the asylum uh, because the syndicates out there, uh, they don't work alone, it's a network. And it also depends on how much information the girls have given 
um, the government over here, if they have said so much, um, they would be in great danger when they get back home. Then besides the danger, um, the trauma of being trafficked is not where the major issue lies. It is post-trafficking, when the girls get back home or when they get back home, issues of mental health, um, they're quite expensive to manage. Uh, like my editor already disclosed, um, I had to be taken to the US for better treatment. On my own, I wouldn't have been able to afford that. So I would say I'm one lucky lady amongst so many. Uh, these young ladies, they are from poor homes. When they get back home, um, their families wouldn't be able to feed them. How much more uh, taking care of their health? They will come down with PTSD, anxiety, depression, just so many issues to be dealt with. So I think they will be safer here. Okay, two more questions. Hi, I'm uh, Josetta from Finland. I, I have uh, some questions for Sean. Uh, did you only work in uh, Abu Dhabi or also in the other Emirates? I'm interested in the if if the government surveillance is is in like similar levels in in all the Emirates or is it uh, worse in in Abu Dhabi? And then. Um, um, have you researched uh, if uh, the Bangladeshi government has a role in, in um, uh, exporting the workers uh, to these camps and, and what are their attitudes to the treatment of, sorry, of sorry, the Sorry, which workers? government? Bangladesh. Oh, Bangladesh, yeah. 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 Well, on, on the first point, um, most of the surveillance was actually from National Security Police, which was covering all of the Emirates. And it increased a lot after the Arab, Arab Spring. You know, until the Arab Spring happened, there was surveillance, but it, it wasn't like 24 hours. So sometimes it was with me, you know. I don't think that would have happened before the Arab Spring. So, And then the second layer was the Abu Dhabi police. And I, I was very fortunate for a long time in that the National Security Police did not share information with the Abu Dhabi police. And in fact, on an audio recording, uh, when I was taken in by the Abu Dhabi police, he, he warned me not to speak on the phone because the national security police are listening to the Abu Dhabi police. And they too are being under surveillance. So he said, you know, don't speak on the phone to me. Um, I benefited from that because uh, had the Abu Dhabi police known that I was under surveillance from the national security police, then they would not have... Uh, been so kind to me and offering me money and holidays and all kinds of things, I would simply have been put in jail, you know. So, um, so yeah, the surveillance is across all the Emirates and, and in some ways I think it's worse in Dubai than it is in Abu Dhabi, you know. Um, on the second point on Bangladesh, um, it's, uh, I would say there's good people within the Bangladesh government trying to do things, but the level of corruption in Bangladesh is absolutely huge. And um, there's a lot of official complacency about uh, recruitment practices. And some of the recruiters in Bangladesh are <clears throat> absolutely unscrupulous. You know, w one of the, the companies that I, I was looking at at NYU as a company called um, Al Jazeera, no relation to the media company, if anybody here is from Al Jazeera. <laughs> and uh, they were just a small Bangladesh outfit. But just to give you an example of what goes on in Bangladesh, the recruiter was living with the workers in uh, their accommodation. And not only did he have their passports like they all have, but he also had their ATM cards. So they couldn't spend anything without asking his permission. And uh, time and time again, they you know, sought assistance from the Bangladesh government, various workers, but didn't get any assistance with it. You know, So I think uh, the answer in Bangladesh is um, some of the regional governments, I think, are, are better than the, than the national government in dealing with these issues. You know? yeah. uh, the last question goes to you. 
Hi, I'm Carl, um, also from a Norwegian newspaper. Uh, my question is to Sean. Uh, obviously, it's a big commitment for, for, for any journalist to travel to Abu Dhabi or whatever and, you know, starting following buses. Uh, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could give any tips on how to uh, make your research beforehand before you pick those uh, targets, if you will, you know, uh, to yeah. proceed further. Uh -huh. um, I, I think uh, the, um, the human rights groups are a fantastic way before you go. They, they can really put you in contact with a lot of great people. Um, I, I, was, I had a constant stream of journalists who were coming in and beforehand, you know, Human Rights Watch in particular were excellent at hooking us up and then we would use, you know, encrypted email to go back and forth and I think that made it a lot easier for them uh, when they got there, then we could just go boom, boom, boom. Like, for example, uh, you know, if you're a Norwegian journalist, obviously you're looking for a Norwegian angle, so maybe I can put you in touch with uh, workers who are working for a Norwegian construction company or something like that. Or, you know, constantly I had uh, journalists who were coming in, let's say, uh, from Britain. Let's, I had a, a journalist who came in from the Independent, so I said, okay, I'm investigating BK Golf, which is a subsidiary of Britain's largest construction company. Let's go to the camps, interview the workers who were beaten and deported. I mean, that would have taken him a year, you know, but through the human rights groups, they were able to filter and say, okay, Sean knows this issue, or maybe another journalist knows this issue. And that's by far the best way to, uh, to approach it. You know, just call Human Rights Watch and say, who, who do you know? Who do you trust? That's, that's a big one too, you know, because some of the journalists in the Gulf, like they really are under government control and they will write a report about you if, if you pick the wrong one, you know. Jan Gunnar is the boss here. He tells me when to end. <laughs> no, no, one more question. Okay, one make... more question. I, wanna, I have a question for Tobori. Uh, how was it for you after all the, the trauma you went through? How was it for you to sit down and write the story? How long did it take? And what was the reaction of the Nigerian society when, when it was published? Okay. Um, when I returned from uh, the final phase of the investigation, um, when I later fell ill, the psychiatrist explained that I was in the maniac phase of depression. Uh, I, in the daytime, uh, I was keeping my medication to be able to write the story because I slept too much. We had a deadline for the story to be submitted. Um, I was trying to be strong. Uh, that was another mistake I made on my part. I wasn't telling my editor exactly how I was feeling. Uh, so I was keeping my medication to be able to write the story. And um, within a short while, I was able to produce part one, part two, part three. I simply just wrote everything that happened. And uh, I sent to the team I was working with uh, before the final version could be written, my health had started slipping down. Um, when the story was published, yes, there was uh, public outrage. And um, the agency in charge of human trafficking in Nigeria, it's called NAPTIP, um, they contacted, they got in touch with uh, Premium Times. Um, we held a meeting, they wanted to know more. We gave them more details so that they could commence their investigations. And um, the story became a foundation for other investigations. And um, it became a subject of reference and discussions amongst investigative reporters. And um, NAPTIP, I haven't gotten in touch with NAPTIP to find out what has been the result of their investigation because I've been in recovery 
I was out of the country for a long while. I've only just returned to Nigeria and um, I'm sticking to the doctor's recommendation that I face my recovery strictly and not get distracted. That is the reason I've not gotten in touch with NAPTIP to know what they've been able to uncover. But as a result of the investigation, NAPTIP um, had been able to spread its tentacles because we're able to let them know that Italy is not the headquarters of sex trafficking from Nigeria anymore. That you need to beam your flashlight on the UAE, particularly Dubai, Egypt, and Malaysia. And uh, I think either a week or two weeks ago, they were able to get some of the trolleys in Dubai. Uh, we've been able to give them useful leads, which they are really utilizing. Very good. Thank you all for coming. I all, I all really recommend that you uh, read Sean's and Tobori's work. You will find it on the internet by Googling. It's very interesting and uh, important. Important. Thank you so much. Thank you.